with our presentation about the new excavations of Tel Beit Shemesh, which is near modern Beit Shemesh. And we have Boaz Gross of uh, Tel Aviv University with us, and he's in charge of the excavations. And I'm so honored and privileged to introduce Boaz to you. And Boaz, please meet uh, VFI uh, volunteers for Israel Educates. And and uh, Steve and Ilana are responsible for it. So I will just want to say that tomorrow there is a presentation about a Mossad at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And then this day it's going to be our usual regular 2 p.m. Eastern time. Okay, we're going back to normal. Boaz, it's all yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. It's a uh, really a uh, pleasure to to share the information regarding uh, my excavation at the uh, Bechemish with you guys. Uh, I'll, before I start the presentation, I want to tell you a bit about myself. I'm a PhD student at uh, Tel Aviv University, uh, or more correctly, I'm renewing my PhD at Tel Aviv University because for the past two years, I've been very, very busy. I've been busy conducting one of the largest salvage excavations ever to be conducted in the world and in Israel for sure and, and that is the one at uh, Tel Bet Shemesh and those of you who don't know what a salvage excavation is it has uh, different names uh, in different countries in uh, in the US it's called cultural resource management which is a very american and very accurate name by the way for the handling of uh, archaeology and antiquities when it comes to development or their imminent destruction. So a salvage excavation, the way we call it uh, here in Israel or in G as it's called in the UK, is what happens when an archaeological site or a site that is deemed by the local law as antiquities is about to be destroyed. Now the reason for this destruction can vary. It can be land erosion, it can be flooding, it can be cliffs falling down into the ocean, but more often than not, probably more than 90% of the cases, it's because of development. In Israel, about 300 salvage excavations are being carried out every year, which encompass about 85 to 90% of all archeology, span field archeology span in the country. And in a country like Israel, um, you basically can't build anything, anything at all, nowhere in the country, maybe in the Negev, down in the desert, without hitting something. And that's not a good thing, actually. It's very interesting for us as archeologists who work in Israel, but it's very, very unfortunate as on one hand, uh, we're a Jewish country, so we have these uh, commandments that we need to procreate way too much. But besides that, uh, we need the place to house everyone and the people need to live and they need to die. Cemeteries are also an issue. And they need to live and ride and drive and work. And we're destroying a lot of antiquities here in Israel annually. So salvage excavations are what we do to limit the scope of the damage, basically. M mostly we will not preserve the site the site will be destroyed. What we do preserve, what we do rescue, what we do salvage is the information regarding the site. Now in Tel Vichemesh, as you will see now, um, because of a very rare um, intervention by local community, we actually managed to save a part of the site. And I will talk about it when we get to it. So let me share my screen. Hold on. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yeah, you see it, uh, you see the next slide or only I can see the next slide? Ilana, help me here. No, we, we can see both. I can see uh, no, both. But I don't want you to see both. I want you to see one. So hold on. Well, this is problematic. So you have to go to hold a- on. Yeah. Hold on, hold on. No, 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 it's okay. Not to worry. Excuse me about this, I'll try again. Now, 
Let's do screen share. And now I'll do this. Now you can only see one, right? Correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we can see one only. We're good. I and that besides being a PhD student at Tel Aviv University, I'm also the vice president of an organization called Israeli Institute of Archaeology, that basically what we do is we conduct salvage excavations around the country, mostly under the auspices of Tel Aviv University. In Israel, you have to have academic auspices in order to conduct any sort of excavation to request a permit. A and we use these funds as much as we can in order to conduct community projects around the country and to make archaeological information accessible to the general public uh, through excavations, conferences, tours, etc. And that is why also why I was very happy uh, to be here today and give you this presentation because it's part of the mission of my organization. So I'm, I'm proud and happy. Uh, to do it, and I'm glad you all came here to listen, even though tomorrow there's a presentation about the Mossad, which is clearly more interesting than me. So uh, let's begin. Uh, first of all, um, Professor Shlomo Bonimovich, I don't know how many of you heard of him. I don't know how uh, immersed you are in Israeli archaeology. Professor Shlomo Bonimovich, or late Professor Shlomo Bonimovich, who died a few months ago, uh, was the excavator of Tel Bet Shemesh for the past 30 years. He was also one of my teachers at Tel Aviv University, and he was a truly brilliant man. And he taught me not just how to dig, I had others to teach me how to dig. He taught me to ask, why are we digging? And he, asked, he taught me to ask, why are we digging the way we're digging? Uh, which are surprisingly, it's a question not many archaeologists ask themselves. They dig because that's what archaeologists do, but they don't ask themselves the questions regarding why and how and the method behind it. And for me, Bonimovich will always be the, the teacher uh, who taught me how to ask these questions. So I would like to honor him uh, by mentioning him uh, in this presentation. Tel Bet Shemesh itself is a main biblical site uh, located uh, west of Jerusalem, a bit southwest of Jerusalem, right in the central uh, highland of Israel, the Shfela. Okay, it's bordering between the higher Shfela, the Jerusalem mountains, and the lower Shfela, which slides down uh, towards uh, the coastal plain, uh, towards uh, Ash Ashkelon, Ashdod, Jaffa, and all the other ancient cities. Uh, Tel Bet Shemesh itself uh, completely controls a wide opening in the Sorek Valley. Now, the Sorek is one of the few uh, permanent streams we have in Israel, streams that, that flow year round. Um, and that basin that Bet Shemesh controls is one of the most fertile lands in the country and was the most fertile uh, areas in the country in ancient times as well which is why the importance of Tel Bet Shemesh itself. This is how Tel Bet Shemesh looks like, or what was known until a few short years ago as Tel Bet Shemesh. I don't know how many of you visited. If you toured the country and you're interested in antiquities, there's a very strong chance you stumbled uh, across it on your way. And you can see on the left-hand side, I'm sorry, I forgot to translate that to English. You can see a road, road 38, Kvish Lashim Vishmone. Road 38, is the main highway uh, that crosses the, the, the Shvela, this highland, from north to south. And it superimposes a very ancient route. When we dig underneath it or right next to it, we find remains of Roman roads, paved Roman imperial roads, including milestones and everything. And we know that alongside it are dotted many, many sites from many periods up to the Neolithic period. So it was a major transportation route for millennia, okay? Now, Road 38 comes over a shoulder in the mound of Tel Bet Shemesh uh, itself and was assumed for by all the scholars that we will survey now uh, that it also borders the, the site itself uh, from the east. 
Talbot Shamish was first identified by Edward Robinson. Edward Robinson was a British uh, explorer, historical uh, historian, uh, geographic historian. Uh, historical geography is a field of study which basically takes historical religious texts uh, from ancient times and go in physically surveying the land, looking for matches between the historical or religious texts in where they depict a mountain, a valley, a stream, a ruin, etc., combining them with the current names of the places, which when Edward Robinson uh, traveled the country, it was the 19th century, most of the inhabitants were Arabic and speaking Arabic, and recorded the names of the place. So he's the first one who identified the ruins of the village of Ein Chams. And Shams basically means the spring of the sun. And as you can see, Shams in Arabic preserves the Hebrew name of Shemesh in Hebrew and um, matching, it, uh, matching it against biblical descriptions of the location of Bet Shemesh above the Sorek, etc. He identified that hill as the ancient Tel Bet Shemesh. The map you see here is not from Robinson. It's from the PEF, the Palestine Exploration Fund which was a British royal organization that set foot to explore all of the Holy Land. When I say the Holy Land, it's part of Lebanon, Syria, Sinai, Jordan, et cetera. And the PEF, it's a, it's a whole topic on its own, but they left us basically a treasure, okay? Because it's the PEF uh, surveyors that first recorded and put on very detailed maps, even if they're not as accurate as we can produce today, but they recorded thousands upon thousands of ancient place names, streams, rivers, ruins, cities, in the way the local Arabs preserved the names. And in many cases, the Arabic name preserved the Hebrew or the Greek name of the place, which allowed us modern scholars and historians to figure out what sites are there from biblical periods or even before. Uh, matching them with Egyptian, Assyrian, Babylonian texts, etc. Here you can see how the hill is located, and you can see that Anchems is marked on a side of a hill, but it's basically it's like a, a elongated ridge. Okay, you can see here very well in this map the PF left for us, and I'll go back to that in a moment. The first excavator of the site was Duncan McKenzie. Uh, he came as part of the PEF, as part of the Palestine Exploration Fund uh, second phase. The first phase was a survey. The second phase was excavation. And they excavated in many important sites like uh, Azeka and Tel Goded and other places, uh, and of course, Jerusalem uh, across the country. And McKenzie was the first one to excavate the Chemish. McKenzie was a fantastic archeologist. Uh, modern archaeologists tend to always uh, overly criticize past excavators because they didn't uh, document properly and their methods were very crude and unsophisticated and nothing like we were today. But I always try to remind my students that archaeology, yes, we are an academic field. We have a lot to do with methodology and we need to do things very, very meticulously and systematically but there's also a lot to do with intuition. And sometimes you cannot take away the intuition of a scholar, of an archeologist. Mackenzie uh, was actually both. He, he actually conducted cutting edge archeology span of his time, and he had very good intuition. He left very good reports of what he did. Uh, unfortunately, he was fired. He was fired for two reasons. One, he wasn't religious enough. He wasn't Christian enough in the eyes of his uh, superiors at the Palestine Exploration Fund, which was a deeply relig religious Christian organization. And they wanted to go and prove biblical narratives, whether it's from the Old Testament or New Testament. And he just wasn't enough. He, he was an archeologist, a professional one and he interpreted finds for what they were and not for what they were supposed to be if uh, to fit one biblical narrative or the other. Uh, the second part, he was a bit embezzling with their funds and he took part of the money for excavating Bet Shemesh and had a whole uh, 
a road trip around Jordan uh, because it was more interesting for him. So they, they, they actually fired him before he had a chance to conclude his excavations. I'm uh, putting this superposition of how the site looks today uh, against Mackenzie's excavation. The second excavation that came to explore Bechemesh was an American uh, ex expedition uh, led by Elihu Grant from ha Haverford College. Um, now he didn't have uh, too much of a professional problem. He was a deeply religious man. I think he was a Methodist priest himself. Um, and he also wasn't a very gifted archeologist. He, what he loved, he, he excavated huge amounts of the site. Uh, it was the, it's not his fault. This is how it was done at the time. I don't know if you know the Chicago expedition at Megiddo, which basically peeled the entire tail one layer after another, causing terrible, terrible damage uh, at the time. But that that's what, what that was the time the, the golden age <laughs> quotes uh, of uh, archaeology uh, in the land of Israel but luckily after Grant left the the site a much more qualified archaeologist took his field notes and journals which were very depictive he was very interested in the weather and the gossip of the local Arab workers that he had and uh, he brought a very gifted archaeologist to write uh, who took his field notes and managed to distill uh, something resembling a coherent report out of them so that was lucky in many cases we don't have even that and what you can see that grant put his headquarters his laboratory field laboratory in an old building this old building was the abandoned or not so abandoned now we start to see Sheik's tomb and a mosque of the village of Enchamps. Now, the village of Enchamps was deserted. It was abandoned like a hundred years before, but local people still maintained the mosque and the, and the tomb because it was a religious site. It was an, an, an important religious landmark. Uh, so they kept it maintained. That's why it didn't collapse in the hundred years that, that passed and Grant uh, commissioned it and uh, used it as a, as a field office, as you can see from the picture here. Now, um, how did it come to happen that all of these scholars, Mackenzie and Grant, both only excavated on the western part of the town? Why never they why didn't they ever excavated under the ruins of Enchamps, which is on the eastern part of the town? So this is what he writes uh, in one of his journals. This site has been excavated before the war. Of course, he's talking about the First World War, okay, before the war, and is situated uh, on a long hill literally divided by the shrine of the Nebi Shemsun, because these are the, the it's Samson, basically. Uh, these were the traditions the local Arabs held for that shrine, uh, which is also called Abu Mizar. Okay, the portion of ruins lying east of the ladder being called Rumele. That is the etcient site where he excavated, etc, uh, etc. Et uh, so he identified the ancient site in the western part. Mackenzie did as well in 1990s when, Israel already founded, and Professor Shlomo Bonimovich and Dr. Tzvi Lederman came and launched an excavation in on the western side. Now, why didn't any of them excavate east of the road? The reason is both logical and ideological. The logical thing is that excavating is expensive. It's very expensive. It's basically the most expensive field of the humanities uh, that there is. Why? It's a big operation. You need workers, you need cars, vehicles, storage, you need uh, equipment, bulldozers, everything, and, and it's expensive. And none of these, this is where I'm going to the ideological, none of these people, not McKenzie and not Grant and not Bonimovich and Lederman, were interested one bit in excavating an Arab village. On the western side of the hill, 
the ancient remains from the Iron Age, from the times of the Kingdom of Judah, the Philistines, the Bronze Ages, the Canaanites, are right under the surface. And they saw it from the beginning. If they wanted to explore the eastern side of the site, where they know that there's an abandoned Arab village, then they would have had to excavate that Arab village. Especially Bonimovich and Lederman, who are modern archaeologists, they are not the type to just bulldoze away the remains that are not, they're not the focus of their interest. Previous scholars did, by the way. Uh, so they didn't want to invest the resources. But by not excavating, they basically created a par paradigm in research. And that paradigm is Bechemish, the ancient site of Bechemish, ends at road 38, which is a modern construct for that matter, okay? They didn't know the ancient path of the road, which later we understood was a mistake. When did we understand that it's a mistake? By the way, here you can see the chart of the uh, different periods that were identified. You can see that Tel Bechemish was um, habited, habitated, I don't know the word in English, uh, populated since the Middle Bronze Age, 1550, and it was abandoned in the 7th century BC. What happened in the 7th century BC, or in the beginning, or the end of the, the 18th century BC? Sennacherib's campaign. Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came to punish the kingdom of Judah after they stopped paying taxes because of very bad understanding of local, of geopolitics and uh, came and had a campaign, destroyed most of the Judahite cities of the Shvela, such as Lachish and Azekah, Beit Shemesh, and then continued eastward, put a siege on Jerusalem, then the narrative, of course, divert. Uh, either it was a plague or he was paid off from the treasures of the temple, or, and that's the more uh, likely um, a conclusion is that there was actually rebellion in Babylon, which is much closer to home in Assyria, to Assyria, and he had to take his forces and go subdue the much more dangerous rebellion that he had near his capital. So that was Sennacherib campaign. And all of the scholars agreed. All of the scholars, I mean, Mackenzie, Grant, and Bonimovich and Lederman, so we're talking 100 years of research, agreed that Bechemish was destroyed in the Sennacherib campaign, and was never resettled. Bonimovich and Lederman suggested that there was an attempt to resettle. Here you can see another report from, from Grant saying uh, exactly that regarding the Assyrian emperor. So all of them agreed that it was abandoned. Bonimovich and Lederman suggested that there was an attempt to resettle the site. And then the local Philistines, the people of Ekron, immediately came and destroyed this new settlement and also killed their way, their, their means of living. On the Western, there is a massive underground water system, basically a, a huge cistern uh, that was found uh, during uh, Bonimovich and Lederman excavations. And it is the only place in the site that material, pottery from the 7th BC, which means after Sennacherib campaign, were found at Bechemish. And they identified or interpreted this find as the destruction of the Philistines of this revival of the settlement and used the debris, the, the, the houses themselves, they took them apart and threw them in to the opening of the cistern because if there's no water, there's no life. And even though the Arabic name of the, the site is Ain Shams, which Ain is a spring, okay? It indicates that maybe there's a water source. There is no water source. There is no spring uh, near Bechemish, which means that people had to, to uh, rely either on walking down to the Sorek, which is, it's a walk, okay, to get water, or they had to cut a rock cut cisterns and, and um, store rainwater. So, Bonim Man decided that if uh, we block off their water system, the Philistines block off their water system, then the site will never be resettled. And actually, they were right because the western side of the site 
was never resettled. And now we're going to modern times. What you see here in the picture, this uh, uh, architectural marvel is the massive expansion of the modern city of Bechemish, uh, which is called Bechemish Heights, <laughs> okay? Which uh, supposed, it, it started construction in the 1990s and it's supposed to uh, be inhabited by around 300,000 new people. Uh, making it one of the largest, larger cities in the country. Uh, but because of it, Road 38, which was already congested, had to be expended. So in the 1990s, when the roads for the expansion of, the plans for the expansion of the roads were submitted to the IAA, to the Antiqu Israeli Antiquities Authority, as they should, because that's the law in Israel, the Antiquities Authority told the road company, it's no problem. Tel Bechemish is in the West. Can you see my mouse or no? Hold on, let me see. No. Can you see it? Okay. Tel Bechemish is here on the West. On the East, there's, okay, there's antiquities. There's an, ab an abandoned Arab village, okay? So if you want to expand Road 38, if you must, do it towards the East, okay? And I remind you, this is before any archeologist ever, excavated underneath the uh, ruins of Inchamps of the Arab village to see what's underneath. They approve the plans, which are massive. They're billions of shekels worth of plans. They approved it before they actually knew what's under there, okay? Which is a screw up, forgive my, my language, okay? But it was done. Hold on, how do I close this? Only in 2012, first probes, examination probes, trenches, as you can see here in the plan, were conducted uh, by Tel Aviv University, myself, by the way, I was an area supervisor there. And pay attention, it's still not east of the road. It's on the eastern shoulder, west of road 38, okay? And in this trenches, D and E, for the first time in a hundred years of excavation, 101, okay? Because Mackenzie started in 1911, this is 2012, 101 years after the beginning of archeological excavations at Bechemish, for the first time, seventh century BCE, Judahite material coming in situ. For those of you who don't know what in situ means, it's in its place. It wasn't relocated. It wasn't brought away from some, brought from someplace else. This is where it is. And it was mostly things that were related to olive oil productions, okay? Vats and storage jars and pits and everything, okay? So already, and the conclusions of the, of the um, excavation director, a native there, and he wrote it in a letter to the Antiquities Authority. For the first time, we have in situ seventh century material. We can clearly see it going under the road. Look at trench E over here. We can see, see walls going under the wall. Find another solution for the road. You cannot destroy this. This is completely novel. We, we had no idea that Bechemish was, was occupied like this in the seventh century. Uh, but as things go, nobody listened. Work continued. 2017, the Antiquities Authority is conducting a large scale examination excavation, 40 excavation squares. An excavation square in these periods is five by five meters, okay? You can see squares right here, okay? So it's five by five meters. And you can see the list of periods that they found where? East of the road, underneath the village. This is the Sheik's tomb. This is the Wali of Abu Mizar where Grant had his camp, okay? His lab, what I'm circling here. It was later relocated to a, a more Eastern location. So in their excavations on the Eastern side, look at the periods, Iron Age, Hellenistic, Byzantine, Early Islamic, Mamluk, Ottoman. How do you call that is made from layer after layer after layer of human occupation? A mound, a tell in Hebrew or Arabic, okay? It was already clear in 2017, before my excavations, that the ancient mound of Bechemish definitely continued after Sennacherib's campaign 
it was just relocated. They just moved to another side of the hill. But it still didn't stop the development plans, okay? And if I sound uh, critical, it's because I am. Uh, the road company divided the site into three sections. The Antiquities Authority now understanding that they have a problem. On one hand, they approved plans before actually knowing what they're approving. On the second hand, they now realize that there's a massive important site that's going to be destroyed. What was their solution? Let's dig the hell out of it, okay? So they demanded 940 excavation squares to be excavated at Tel Bechemish. Just to put things in perspective, Bonimovich and Lederman, who excavated the, the Western Mount, they excavated in 30 years, 99 squares. They haven't finished any of them. They haven't reached bedrock in any of these squares, nor should they, by the way, like they're doing an academic excavation. They should do it very slowly, gradually. Okay, 940 squares at El Bechemish were demanded by the Antiquities Authority to be excavated to bedrock and below, low bedrock, which happens, and as you will see. And there was a bid, I won't go into all the depths of the bids, but Tel Aviv University, Israeli Institute of Archaeology, which is my organization, uh, got to excavate section A, you can see section A right here, okay, which is a 400 square large, we divided it into different areas, the squares that you see here, this is before the excavation, you can see May 2018, and the squares that you see already open here are the remains of the examination excavation, so this is what we knew that there is there. This is how it looked like in 2019, and as you can see, it's insanely large and complicated stratified site. And you'll see just how stratified soon. This is how it looked like. Uh, I can't see what says there if it's April or May, but 2020. Okay. And as you can see, we already destroyed all of this area to bedrock. Why only this area and not this area? I'll get to it in the end. And this is what we found, okay? A settlement from, I, I, I'm putting aside the late Bronze Age because we only found one cistern, not a real settlement. So it's probably some protrusion of the Western Mount, but a settlement from the Iron Age, from the which lasts all the way to the late Ottoman, all the way to the, to the 19th century when the Enchams is, is uh, abandoned excluding only it's every historical period in the land of israel represented at the site excluding only the crusader and uh, umayyad uh, and ayubic periods so the crusaders and salah that came after but from the mamluk uh, it goes on again i don't i know you don't read hebrew or some of you maybe don't read hebrew but this is the, the these are the layers of the examination excavation which can show you that we actually didn't renew much. We just saw it much, much, much bigger. Let me start talking about what we have at the site. So from the late uh, bronze period, we have a sole find, and not from lack of digging. We dug almost to bedrock 400 squares, OK? The only thing we have uh, in east of Road 38 from the late bronze uh, period is this very large and very nice uh, water system. Here you can see a 3D uh, model of it. I don't know how choppy it looks like on your Zoom. On my end, it looks great. Um, I can tell you also we found very, very interesting remains inside. I have to keep discretion here uh, because of some sensitivities this uh, country has, uh, but it will be published eventually, so uh, stay tuned. Uh, from the Iron Age to the Persian period, maybe even early Hellenistic, we have a site that is focusing almost solely, solely on the production of olive oil and wine, okay? In such density that it makes us think that after Sennacherib's campaign, the Western side of the site was destroyed. Now Judah is under the domain of the 
it's a vassal state. It's no longer an, an uh, independent kingdom. It is now a vessel of Assyria. As a vessel of, of Assyria, they must raise a lot of taxes. So in order to raise a lot of taxes, they must intensify and industrialize their production. What kind of taxes Judah can, can produce? There's no gold anywhere. Believe me, I tried looking. The only thing Judah knows how to produce besides political and religious unrest is wine and olive oil, okay? And that's what's being done here at Beit Shemesh. Wine press after wine press, olive press after olive press, very systematically placed in order to maximize the area. Here you can see one of these olive oil presses. And as you can see, for the seventh century, it's actually quite a complicated installation. And here you can see point of how it looked like when operational. Usually we find these with only one beam or two. So we have here four, and next to it, we have another one with another four. And besides that, we have another 15 around the site, which is a lot. For here you can see another installation with vats. And another thing that was very interesting in the Iron Age, when, when we find architecture, and we didn't find a lot of architecture, not because we feel that there was it wasn't there, but because the site was so uh, heavily used in later periods uh, that uh, the, the later inhabitants kept, kept digging all the way to bedrock to put the foundations on bedrock because it's the be best foundation. The, the superposition uh, wasn't very good over here, but we do have is a lot of uh, offering is the right word. It's kind of like a, a ritual deposit underneath floors or underneath uh, uh, walls. Um, maybe it's part of some ritual, but that's what archaeologists say every time they don't understand uh, something. Uh, and inside of this jar that you can see in the ground, you can see a lot of basically like a set. Uh, there were juglets and a, a bone spatula and a lot of uh, olive oil seeds and a lot of material. Of course, everything is being sent to analysis and uh, in the future, I'll be able to tell you what was inside it. The material culture from the Iron Age Persian period at the site is strictly Judahite. Why am I stressing this? Because previous scholars said, or after Bechemish was destroyed by Sennacherib, the Philistines took control over the area, or was overgiven control by, the, by Assyria over the area. But we can see from the material culture, from the finds we have, the site is still very much representing Judahite, highland material culture, rather than coastal uh, material culture, including a, a stamped jar, uh, jar handles, uh, which I don't know if you've heard of uh, the studies of the Lifshitz and others regarding how they belong to a Judahite administrative economic system created in order to raise taxes uh, to uh, to Assyria in many parts, okay, and later Babylonian and later Persian um, overlords. In the early Hellenistic period, we can start seeing monumental construction, such as this big revetment. I'm, I'm, I'll be careful; I won't call it. Uh, um, fortification, even though it's a very big wall. But this big wall also has an entrance, a very nice one, to an underground chamber. And as you can see it over here, it has a pillar supporting the roof. This chamber where this lady is standing, this is Angela, she was the uh, area supervisor of this uh, area. It's also connected with a uh, Balkhova revolt uh, hideout system, which I'll get to it in a bit. In the late Hellenistic or Hasmonean period, the site becomes a Jewish village, a Jewish, properly Jewish village with all of the markers that you would expect to find in a Jewish village of the time. Markers, I'm talking about ritual baths, mikvehs, okay, uh, stone uh, vessels, uh, limestone vessels that had certain uh, rules of purification and, and uh, kosher uh, rules about them. 
coins of the period. This is uh, uh, John Horkinus uh, uh, coins that we found. And, and that is the, the cherry on top, a synagogue. Second temple period synagogues are extremely rare. We know of about 13 or 14 in the entire country. And why do we know of so few? First of all, we don't really understand what a synagogue was at the time. <laughs> So the temple still exists, there's still worship and there's still offerings at the temple in Jerusalem. That's true until 70 AD when the Romans destroyed the temple. Synagogues are identified by being a monumental building in a Jewish village. Usually it has a bench, this one does, okay, along the interior. Sometimes there's some altar or a stage or an elevated platform, but not always. Sometimes it's made of ashlar, not always. So the rules, are, there's no dogma yet. There's no, there's no halakha on how to construct a synagogue yet. The access can vary. This one is, the access is north, north to south, not east to west. Is after the destruction, synagogues were built. So how do I identify a synagogue? We're trying to uh, look at um, matching criteria, such as being a very unique building in a Jewish town, being in the vicinity of mikvehs, of ritual bath, having a bench, etc. But some of them are, some of them don't. So it's a very fluid expression. Uh, that Angela that you saw in the picture before, and I'm very proud to say it's the first MA thesis that came out of this excavation already, by the way, she submitted it a few months ago, deals with monumental uh, buildings in rural Judea and focusing on this building as a test case, uh, proving basically or strongly suggesting that it is a synagogue. I I'm sure you will all be mortified to learn that it was already dismantled this building, it was not preserved at the site, and I'll get to it in a bit. Okay, I won't go into the details, but this is the bench, plaster, etc. a model to show off again how uh, modern we are. I still didn't figure out what we can do with these things besides that it looks cool and presentation. Maybe I'm just being overly traditional about it, but it does look cool on presentation, so I'll do it. The Jewish settlement at Bechemesh ended its life most likely during the time of the Bar Kokhba revolt in the second century AD or CE. So the site is riddled with local, not massive tactical uh, hideout system, but very domestic hideout systems, usually just underneath the homes, just underneath connecting uh, disused uh, water systems, et cetera, et cetera. But there are dozens of them uh, across the site and which we have surveyed. After a short period of, of abandonment, the site is reoccupied, resettled during the late Roman period or early Byzantine, we're talking fourth century CE, fifth century CE. And this time, it's something else else altogether. We don't have a settlement. We don't have a village. We don't have a town. What we do have, have is a massive industrial zone, OK, which produce here pottery kilns, OK? Pottery kilns that made pretty much only storage jars, very distinct storage jars that were meant for local distribution in the region, but they are one of the biggest, most preserved uh, uh, pottery kilns from the period to ever be found in excavations in Israel. And here you can see all of the stages of uh, all of the architecture of this kiln. At the bottom here, this is the firing chamber. The firing chamber was closed off by some arches. There are vents coming up. You see these coming up, vents to deliver the heat up to the floor. You can see here the floor. And on top of this floor, it's where the pottery vessels were laid in order to be fired. It was a clean firing. There was no direct contact between the fire and the vessels themselves, only a, a channeling of heat, which is a very sophisticated uh, technology for the time. 
and in most cases you don't find it so intact to see how it how they were built so this is really a great find olive oil presses this is a very well preserved you can see in the the where the this is a screw weight okay this is the indicative of the byzantine period another screw weight here on its side two vats the crushing uh, basin and it's not the only one. By the way, guys, I see you writing messages in chat. Are these messages for me? I, I just can't read while I'm doing it. I'll answer questions in yeah, the yeah, end. The, the, all the questions are written as people think about it, and then you will answer in the end. Okay, okay so good, because I have, I have a, a, no, a, a... No, 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 you're a, not supposed to look at chat and talk at the same time. No. Very, I have a very uh, sod and minute attention span, uh, so I'll try not to, okay? so. Here you can see a Byzantine, massive Byzantine complex, which has two olive presses, okay? One olive oil press uh, complexes, one over here and another one over here. And this very big building, this is almost 30 meters long, 27 meters long. So it's a massive building. We still don't know what it was used for. The reason we don't know what it was used for is it's because it was drastically changed in a later period, in the early Islamic period. So we don't have any finds on floors or anything from the Byzantine period, which is we're working on it. A, a big, large uh, wine press. And here you can see, again, a, a drawing of how it was used. Um, an industrial one, usually the non, the local one, domestic ones, or small, small rural ones didn't have the screw in the middle to extract the most out of the grapes, okay? So this one does have it, which means that they, they didn't care so much about quality, they cared about quantity and to make the most out of the produce. And the ruins that you see here are at the top of the Western Mound. The, these ruins, this be excavated by McKenzie in 1911. He identified it, as a Byzantine convent. We called it the convent. And now we're starting to think differently. We actually think this is a fortified farmhouse uh, from the Byzantine period uh, because we actually found maybe the church <laughs> of, that, uh, of that town in our excavations. And I'll get to it. I'll get to it now, apparently. So the building that you see here is do you remember what it is? This is the synagogue, okay? This is the synagogue from the Hasmonean village time. But on top of it, we have remains of a decorated mosaic. Now, this decorated mosaic is dated to the 5th to 7th century from the Byzantine period. And when we excavated and dismantled, sadly, this building, we also found that massive parts of it were reconstructed in the Byzantine period, but reconstructed to match the ancient style, to match how it looked like in the Hasmonean period. What does it tell us? That in the Byzantine period, they took this building, they rebuilt it, and they rebuilt it in the same shape that it had before. They divided it in the middle, or almost in the middle, by this wall over here, and put the only decorated uh, mosaic that we found in the site at all, and again, not from lack of digging, okay? And they put it here in a what? What did I say? Look at this north arrow here, okay? So the ancient building is in an axis of north-south, but the mosaic itself is in an axis of east-west, okay? So we believe that they reused the synagogue as a chapel. Christians at the time worship east to west, or west to east, basically. So, and as the center is missing. The pillars that you see here are from a later early Islamic building, which we suspect that maybe the center of the mosaic was destroyed on purpose by the later inhabitants of the site during the early Islamic period, because maybe it uh, held a religious text, a Christian religious text, it held a figure, which the Muslims do not care about so much, so maybe they have removed it. So we have a reuse of a religious building or cultic building, again in the Byzantine period for religious or cultic purposes, which is interesting for us. I'll go quickly, early Islamic period is a very large, very rich uh, rural village. The wine press is taken out of use, okay? 
in many cases, by the way, it, it used to be a paradigm in, in, in research that the Muslims completely came, came and completely ruined all of the wine industry in the land of Israel or anywhere they conquered. Now we know it's not actually true. We have many Christian sites around the country that not only were not destroyed, but flourished in the early days of the uh, Islamic uh, dynasties. But in this case, uh, it was indeed uh, decommissioned. Uh, we don't see a destruction at the site. It's not like we have burnt areas and dead people and anything. It was probably a gradual transition and change of the population. Um, but we do see a decrease, for example, in pig bones. So we do know that there was a, a shift at the site. I can say that the inhabitants are, during the early Islamic period were still Christian because during the Byzantine period, we had very high ratios of pig bones. And during the early Islamic period, we see a very drastic decrease, which tells us something about an ethnic or cultural uh, preference that and um, part of the things that we find in the early Islamic uh, period is this um, mass death of goats and sheep uh, that were found buried under a collapse, and a collapse uh, probably caused from an earthquake. Uh, we attribute this earthquake to the massive earthquake of 70, 749 CE. It's a very famous earthquake. It destroyed Tiberias and acres and many parts of the country and um, caused probably a, 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 an entire dynasty to, to fall uh, in the rise of the Abbasid uh, dynasty. Um, so this complex is very interesting. This is what we call in archaeology uh, a poor man's Pompeii effect. Okay, Pompeii effect in archaeology is what we call when we have an instantaneous a uh, moment frozen in time uh, so pompeii of course is uh, <laughs> is the best you know volcanic ash and all this preservation but earthquakes provide us something similar sometimes especially if the place wasn't completely rebuilt or the the remains were removed and such as in this case they were just put they just put another floor on top of the collapse and reused it so we have this interesting uh, but uh, very nice image below. The material culture of this village is very rich, okay? It was a wealthy settlement. It was a rural settlement, but a wealthy one. You can see here, by the way, the Star of David uh, at the bottom of oil lamps. Don't let it fool you. It's not a Jewish symbol at the time, okay? It's a symbol that originated from India. The Muslims brought it through Iran, through Mesopotamia, uh, and, and, and adopted it uh, as a symbol. Uh, Muslims had a problem uh, with depictions because they couldn't depict figures. So they used a lot of floral or geometric patterns as, as a decoration as, um, to, to pretty things up. Okay, so this is a, uh, not a Jewish symbol at the time. And uh, the Sheikh's tomb itself was probably uh, first built in the early Islamic period, maybe not as a Sheikh's tomb, of course but as some sort of a building, and you can see the early plan of the structure. In the Mamluk and Ottoman period, we have a very large village. I'll show you a video of how it looks like. And I'm very, very interesting things for us as Israelis, as Jews, you know, Judite village, 7th century BC, a Hasmonean village, synagogues and stuff. But to be honest with you, this is the thing I'm proud the most about. This is the largest excavation to ever take place ever in a Ottoman village. Don't forget that until not long ago, these sites were either completely ignored by the academic, uh, and that's for, for and that's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is that they're superimposing more interesting remains uh, from biblical periods below, and they were just bulldozed away. So this is the largest excavation of a Mamluk Ottoman village in history to be done in modern uh, methods and thoroughly. And we're going to do, we're, we're going to take this all the way. By the way, we submitted, I don't know if you know what ASOR is, it's a big conference, archaeological conference. 
um, that takes place annually in the United States, we're already presenting uh, some of the first results from the study of this village um, in Chicago, hopefully in November, if the sky will open. So if you want to come and visit, you're welcome to. You can see how the houses, the units were built. We can see that this is a very, it's a very tribal uh, construction site, a uh, construction pattern, settlement pattern. It's basically a house adjacent to a house adjacent to a house, and it's an ag organic growth. Okay, it's probably either a rich man married another woman, and by Islamic law, he must provide her and her children her own sp their own space. He can't put all the wives together. Uh, she needs a, a bed. She needs place for her children. She needs her own kitchen. And the Muslim men who marries more than one wife must give it to her. Or it's a son that got married, so they just expand the the, the clan's uh, house, build another unit for the for the son and his wife and uh, and uh, his children. So this is how it looks like in the archaeology. We have olive presses again. Uh, this time in the Ottoman period, it's in caves. Okay, here you can see the reconstruction, how it looked like. We have another cave, uh, which uh, we're going to excavate in the coming months. Okay, we haven't excavated it. And I'll tell you in a moment why we ex haven't excavated here. As we started excavating the site, uh, very shortly after, it became apparent that the Antiquities Authority made a horrible, as you can see from this aerial picture, this is not something that should be destroyed to build a road. Simply not. The state needs to invest the funds, build the tunnel, find the solution to not destroy this. And for the first time, I saw a community, the community of the people of Bechemish, rising up and starting to lobby and demonstrate. They breached my own excavation to demonstrate, by the way. I was OK with it because I, I, I agreed with them. Yeah, even though it was very dangerous because they could have fallen into the squares and die. But they, the, the community itself lobbied. They lobbied to their mayor. They lobbied in parliament. They lobbied with the road company and the, and the antiquities authority. And not because of my fines, but because of the pressure the community put on the officials, the antiquities authority and the road company sat back at the drawing board and they decided not to develop this entire width which is 70 meters this okay not to develop the entire width in a very sloping scenery or landscaping that they wanted to do but to cut a very deep 15 meters deep trench at this line where the red lines are to fortify it with cement and the road will be only 25 meters wide and it will run over here unfortunately things are still being destroyed here, such as the synagogue, okay? And because it was being destroyed, the Antiquities Authority came. They marked each stone and gave it a name and number, uh, documented it, and then dismantled it. It's a very sad uh, process, but they dismantled it in order to uh, later reconstruct it after the road is con built uh, to reconstruct it in an alternate uh, alternative uh, location now it's very important to stress that reconstruction of an archaeological monument is scientifically mute okay there's nothing to do with it from archaeological perspective but it does have a touristic or cultural let's say importance for allowing laymen or tourists or visitors to come and see what was here. So it doesn't serve us archaeologists anymore, but I truly hope that it's a compromise that will still allow the, the public to, to enjoy and learn and appreciate the site a bit more. What you see here is an excavation at uh, Moza. This is Moza? No, this is Moza. This is at Asawil. This is in northern Israel. This is Moza near Jerusalem. These were both massive excavations conducted by the Antiquities Authority. Um, I'm using this stage again to, to, to be a bit critical. Whenever <laughs> the Antiquities Authority finds a site that is so important that requires an excavation of this scale, 
the answer should be not to excavate in this scale, but to force the developer to change their plans. Okay, because anything that justifies uh, putting a road, uh, excavating 1,700 squares of a Neolithic city, which nobody knew that there were Neolithic cities near Jerusalem, or at all, by the way, uh, and to destroy it for the benefit of a road. Um, so the, the solution should be to just change the road and not to destroy the site and not to excavate it at all, by the way, after you already know what it is, not to excavate it as a salvage excavation anymore. And why? Besides the, 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 the horrible destruction of antiquities, the excavating in this scale produces enormous amounts of finds, millions of finds, millions. Now in archeology, span we have a problem of publication anyway. Most of us are almost clinically hyper good at it, okay? We like to manage people, we like to dig, to get dirty, to, to move. We run into trouble when we need to sit down and start to analyze all the stuff we've done. And make no mistake, digging without publishing what you've excavated scientifically for your peers to review, to criticize, to learn from, is nothing more than looting. We're just looting in neat squares instead of just ugly pits, but we're looting unless we publish. And the challenge of publishing scientifically millions of finds in walls and floors and architectures and layers is it, it's a it's a very very big challenge that right now i am as a manager as a director of one of these projects this is something i need to face and that's what we've been doing in the past year and a half working almost around the clock a team of maybe 45 people on this which requires also a lot of funds as you can imagine yeah, you can see already pottery and tables. Uh, now all of this is already restored. This is from a Balkochva cave. So this is a, a, a vessel from the revolt. So why am I calling it the, the missing tell? I think uh, this presentation, maybe, maybe I managed to deliver this message. The Tel Bechemish is not just this hill that everyone knew for a hundred years uh, and excavated for a hundred years, okay? Tel Bet Shemesh reaches far more to the east, by the way. We know the remains continue even eastwards, beyond the boundaries of our own excavation, uh, which is a lesson to all of us archaeologists and uh, archaeologists and enthusiasts about archaeology. It's a, 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 an archaeology archaeology is a work in progress. Everything you say is only true for what you know and see. Okay, but tomorrow someone else can come and dig the square next to you that you didn't know and you didn't see and find something else altogether. And also, if you're digging for a hundred years in a site in this scale, put a probe or two in the, on, across the road. Uh, maybe it will help you uh, understand the site uh, a bit better. So uh, I'm done with uh, my presentation. Uh, this, this is Angie again, Angela. She went back to Canada before finishing her report. It's very unfortunate, but uh, I'm, I'm chasing her. Uh, this is just a video to show you the sheer scale. Uh, maybe you didn't get it so much uh, from the pictures. Uh, the sheer scale of this project, of this excavation. I am very, very proud to say that we've managed to allocate the initial funds to launch a community project in the area that's not going to be this area over here. And we're already working tomorrow, I'm there actually excavating with uh, the first school that joined our program, uh, a religious school for girls in Bachemish, uh, a high school in um, junior high. And they're coming and digging one of the mikvehs. We haven't, the ritual baths, we haven't finished excavating and they're going to dig one of the underground olive presses. Uh, the reason for this community project is not because I really crave to have more information to publish, not at all. I, this project comes out of 
a responsibility that I feel I have for the site. I know how construction, especially road construction works. And I know that this red line that you saw in one of the slides is not gonna stop a bulldozer from covering one of the walls that were not supposed to be destroyed. And if we don't, as the Americans like to say, if we don't have uh, boots on the ground, uh, all the time, year round, and pay very close attention to what's going on at the site, even the things that were saved from destruction. Uh, and also, I was so impressed with the community involvement uh, at Bechemesh that saved the site, literally saved the site. Uh, I feel like we as an archaeological community must give back. And we can give back by bringing the community into the archaeological sites to let them explore, let them research, sometimes even let them publish some of the things. Uh, because these are skills and knowledge that they will take with them. Uh, and if someone works at a site, it doesn't come in the late afternoons and put trash in it, and they, they don't come and destroy and vandalize. And they can come with their families, their parents first, and later their own children, and tell them, look, this is where I excavated. I did this. I discovered this. So I hope you enjoyed uh, this presentation. Uh, I was very happy uh, to give it. If you're interested, uh, you can go to our website of Israeli Institute of Archaeology. You can follow us on Facebook as well. If you want to come to dig, to learn more, uh, just contact me and I'm sure we will uh, figure out a way. I heard you're volunteering in Israel, so I will uh, very glad, gladly uh, host you in my excavation. Uh, Boaz, toda raba. thank you so much. It was uh, wonderful and fascinating. And uh, I'm sure people who just listened to you, they would be so happy to join you excavating. The problem is that we need the sky to reopen to do that because 99% uh, of the participants are located on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. And so we need to wait. But I personally, I might join you excavating. I'm not that far away. so. Um, we have a few questions here, okay, uh, so uh, just before we, uh, I start reading, would you like me to read the question for you? Yes, or, please. Uh, I think yeah, I will. Okay, question. okay, so no problem. So in a minute, so for people who need to go somewhere else, okay, so thank you for joining us again, and you're welcome to join uh, Dr. Luf, uh, Brigadier General uh, Yossi Kupovacel tomorrow, you have all these details. Thank you, Lana, on chat. And also the emails uh, you got from Steve. And you're very much welcome to join me um, the day after tomorrow, Thursday, at usual time along the Lebanese border. We will be uh, driving along the Lebanese border, stopping at so many different beautiful sites, natural wise and cultural wise and uh, historical and archeological of course in Lebanon, and we, we will have so much to do along the Lebanese border. So uh, that's it, that's for the future, and let's uh, get back to present. So first question, um, okay, uh, Cheryl, uh, she wrote that she participated in a dig at Tel Bechemish in 2006 as a college student. So thank you for- I was there in 2007. Okay, so she, she joined before you. Okay. By the way, someone someone um, wrote, Howard wrote, ironically, if not for the development, we probably wouldn't know the antiquities were there. It's mm -hmm. very, very true, uh, Howard. I don't know if Howard is still with us. Uh, I'm here. I'm here. Uh, hi, Howard. Yeah. It's very, very true. But I, I, if there's a, one thing I, I would be glad if you all take uh, with you from here today. Salvage excavations are not good. Proudly, I make a living from salvage excavation, but it, we must all remember that they're not good. For anything with, that we do know and that we did find, we have to think of what have we lost. Salvage excavations, they're too fast. They're using, and we're using unskilled workers, hundreds of them. I had 170 workers. I had a staff of 25 archaeologists. It wasn't enough to pay attention to everyone while 
in, uh, uh, maintaining proper documentation and registry. You do not know what we've missed. You don't know what small finds we've missed. You don't know what architecture, such as floors. Floors can be beaten earth. A worker doesn't know to stop on beaten earth's floor. They doesn't feel it. The pickaxe goes through it like nothing, okay? So my perspective is, yes, it's wonderful. It's amazing. Now we know so much. It would have been better to divert the road not to know all that we know so much right now and let professors from universities dig this with students and volunteers such as yourself for the next two centuries and discover this gradually and not over a span of one year. Oh, I agree. I'm not saying the road should have gone through. But yeah. Planning the no, road, it, it, it's definitely a silver lining. This is what, th this is my comfort in this. Uh, but definitely, and, and, it, and it is fascinating. Um, but I would have preferred, just like you, that the road would have gone somewhere else. Okay. Um, there is a question by Robin. How is the synagogue dated? Could it be uh, between Roman conquest or Jerusalem before destruction of the temple? Well, we, it's very uh, uh, difficult to, to date to such a, a resolution. We do know from layers, first of all, from the pottery that we found just underneath and in between the stones as we dismantled it and the layers that have abutted that came up against the walls uh, that it is from the early Roman, late Hellenistic, early Roman period, which means it can be late Hasmonean, it most likely is Herodian um, in the time of construction was during the, the reign of King Herod or one of his uh, successors. Uh, but definitely before the, the destruction of the temple at 70, 70 CE. Okay, uh, Stuart uh, says, I've worked with Odette Lipschitz at Ramat Rachel. Uh, is the Beit Shemesh site open for viewing? So right now the Beit Shemesh, the Beit Shemesh is uh, very uh, dangerous, okay? Uh, the, the pits are very, very deep. There are walls that are, uh, haven't been uh, preserved yet. Most of it will be covered uh, in the next year, I think. It will be covered and only according to the plan of the archeological park, park that's being, will be constructed there, hopefully. It's impossible to preserve a site this large and maintain it uh, in a proper way. The best preservation is in the ground. So they chose several markers, several key points of interest. Those will be preserved and open to the public and the rest will be covered. Right now, please, if you're in Israel, don't come without arranging it uh, with us because it is super, super dangerous uh, and not insured, by the way. So, oh. so and okay. also I worked in Bechemish, in uh, Ramat Rachel. I don't know what year you were there. I was an area supervisor and wrote my MA thesis on the ancient garden at Ramat Rachel. Mm -hmm. All right. Harry uh, asked uh, how much destruction of site is going on with other developments? Are laws not enforced? No, th th this is how the law is enforced. Um, I don't know if, you're me if you mean destruction without uh, salvage excavation before or destruction as I showed you here, that first there's a salvage excavation and then the destruction comes. Uh, wanton destruction of, of uh, archeological site in Israel proper is rare today. The Antiquities Authority um, is, is doing their job well in that regard that uh, plans are being watched and there are inspectors uh, scarring the country at construction sites to make sure that nobody is destroying antiquities without going through the proper channel of excavating, uh, salvage excavations before and only then release and end the destruction. The problematic part, by the way, the situation is completely different in the West Bank where it's, it's almost complete chaos and, and, uh, and anarchy regarding the, the destruction of antiquities. But if you mean the destruction of archeological sites after uh, salvage excavations, then yes, it's everywhere. It's way too massive. I, I can share with you, there's a problem with the budgeting and authorities of the antiquities authority. Actually, the antiquities authorities budget is based on excavating. 
so if they will not excavate, uh, they won't have a budget. They won't be able to maintain themselves. And if they will not release the area for development, i.e. destroying, the, letting developers destroy the site, in the end, they'll have to give back the money for the excavation. So they dig to survive and then release in order to survive. And it's a problem with the Israeli law of antiquity and Israeli law of the antiquities authority. Um, but this is a whole other um, lecture. It's actually the topic of my PhD. Okay, we have something to look forward to. Yeah. Uh, when will you finish your PhD? The, why, uh, why, why? <laughs> Why are you asking me such a rude question? To ruin oh, sorry. Life? No, no, no. no, no I'm I, kidding. I, no, I, uh, no, I never, I never asked it. No. I, I hope, I hope in the next two years. I had to put it on hold for two years because of excavating in the Chemish. Okay. Well, you are becoming a professional without a PhD in front of your name, so don't worry about it. I never finished <laughs> my master's in biology, but that's a different topic. Uh, okay, uh, we well, right now we ran out of questions on chat. So ladies and gentlemen, if you have any further questions, so you're welcome just to unmute yourself and, uh, you know, um, say it aloud. And uh, Steve, you just that unmuted was, yourself. Was, Thank you. Uh, I particularly appreciate your method of thinking, and I think it um, it's a good lesson for all of us just to approach things using sort of the methods that you're employing, looking at old things and trying to figure out what happened. It, it's just an interesting way to look at things, and I appreciate your presentation today. Thank you very much. Thank you. By the way, somebody did ask the question, is this presentation being recorded? Yes, it is. And in a couple of days, it will appear on VFI uh, Educates listed at the uh, tiny URL. Uh, and Ilana may have put up the, the yeah, address. She, to she did. Yes. already yes. answered that question okay. in the ground. The Thank time. you. It is there. OK, so um, well, I, uh, I would assume that next time when we all meet in person, we will be visiting uh, Tel Beit Shemesh, and uh, we will coordinate it with Boaz, of course. And I really hope that you will make it before he makes his PhD. So uh, let's, <laughs> let's uh, see who is faster, OK? <laughs> I, I, I hope I'll be faster. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I hope the sky will be open before like next two years. Yeah, Come on. maybe. Um, okay. But we have uh, thanks uh, from different participants on chat and uh, people who did not write it on chat. I'm sure they, uh, they are grateful. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so, so much for your time. Bye. Shalom. Bye. Shalom. Shalom. Thank you.